This is a Fujitsu Siemens T24BA 24 inch LCD monitor which uh, I picked out of a trash a few days ago and uh, it seems to be just a monitor of excellent quality. Uh, it's a 1920x1200 uh, pixel display which uh, doesn't really have much of a way of features but uh, if you take a look at it it's absolutely giant. Now you could assume that this is just a very old monitor, but it should be uh, 2007 to 2009 vintage, so it's not really that old. And the reason for this thickness is uh, that this is a properly backlit LCD display. It's uh, not just uh, edge lit like most monitors are, but it actually has a row of tubes going the entire length, uh, height of the panel. And uh, the most impressive thing is, this thing still works. In fact, I don't know why it was discarded. So I figured we'd take it apart and uh, have a look at what makes it tick. Uh, the little I've been able to peek through these uh, vent holes uh, has looked quite impressive indeed. So, let's go. And there we go, we're in. And uh, right away you can see that it's got a bit more metal to it than you usually get in these. Uh, getting it apart was uh, like a typical LCD monitor. You pry the front bristle off and uh, then you put it on the front and lift the back off. But uh, the white plastic really has you be quite peculiar because it's gone very hard and very brittle. I think this one's probably set in a window or something given how yellow the backside and top are. So that was a bit of a bummer. Thankfully it didn't crack all the way through and the crack becomes invisible once it's actually squeezed in place. Anyway, around the back we have pretty ordinary stuff. Oh, this is a bit curious. We have wires coming from one box into the other. It almost seems as if we've got a power supply here and an inverter there. Hmm, I suppose we'll find out. Uh, input board there, speakers on the side. Now, something that I noticed right away about this monitor is that it kind of looks very similar in layout and uh, construction to my uh, Packard Bell W2400 something monitor from about 2007, which uh, has a similar just mechanical layout to it. So I'm wondering if this might not be a very similar uh, construction of the inside, perhaps manufactured by the same company. I remember my Packard Bell is a ProView branded monitor, so we will find out once we get another couple of screws out. Alright, first set of screws is removed, so let's see what we get inside. If we get inside. Yeah, that looks a bit more high-end than your usual LCD. <laughs> wow, just look at those transformers. Two per channel, that's... That's... That's some good build quality. Wow, and proper fiberglass board too. We do have some Suscon caps, which I'm probably going to do something about. I think I have 220, 35 volts in stock. But wow, that's some impressive build quality right there. Very discreet construction, very beautiful construction actually. This, this has to be one of the best looking LCD monitor inverters I've ever seen. Do I have a date code on anything? 0843, but that could be something special. 21st of the 9th, 2007. See so, yeah, if this is going to be a 2007 to 2009, something like that model. Wow, this thing must have been quite expensive when it was new. And you undo another couple of screws along the sides, and you just have to get the little display cable out, and we are all the way in. And I really do spy some Chemicon caps in there. Hmm. 
want to get this board out and give it an overview anyway because I'm going to use this monitor for myself and we've got a little heating and linear regulator on the control board a little grinding spring there and this is a bit curious, it's built like an LCD TV with a TCON like board sitting attached to the actual panel assembly and the panel assembly being an LG LM240WU3 TLB1 so I'm going to find a data sheet on that and here's a data sheet for it so it seems to be specified for a uh, pretty well actually but it sheets data July 23rd 2008 and we've got contrast ratio specified at 600 a luminance of 320 to 400 candle per square meter which is a lot although I only measured about 200 and I think it was 247 when I put my spider 4 on it but uh, it might not have been warmed up and the viewing angles are kind of meh about 70 to 85 degrees but uh, curiously the horizontal and the vertical angles are about the same which is really uncommon for a TN LCD they, they usually have pretty okay left right angles but absolutely horrid up down angles in fact uh, at first I thought this was uh, a PVA or VA of some sort panel uh, since my other LCD which uh, is of similar construction uh, was a PVA panel uh, and uh, it looked very similar it looked very similar uh, in that you could kind of look at it from almost any angle and it would not even do the inverted color thing or anything although I did notice at one stage when you really went below and from the side it would invert the color so that's when I realized that the Fujitsu was indeed a TN panel but uh, as far as TN panels go, it's mighty impressive. Mighty impressive indeed. Also specified for a 92% color gamut, which uh, I suppose I'll be able to verify when I calibrate it. Uh, now, a cur really impressive thing about this is, despite its age, uh, the default preset was uh, something like uh, 6200K, uh, which, uh, you know, when, when a CFL LCD ages, uh, you get uh, a drop in color temperature, an old one is going to be closer to 5000 and even below and a new one is going to be a lot closer to 6500 or 7000 Kelvin so these panels, since they just have so much uh, tubes in them they're just not going to drive the tubes very hard at all and given how high class the inverter seems to be I'm really not surprised that we haven't worn our tubes out so with no less delay, let's get these boards out and have a closer look at them. And here are the two boards revealed in their full glory. And uh, this really is a beautiful LCD power supply. Mostly just out of the component choices, the general uh, layout of it seems to be pretty standard for an LCD power supply. Although we have three separate power transformers and uh, we have about 90% uh, Nippon Chemicon KY series caps which are excellent capacitors rated for very long lifetimes the, these four here up in the edge are 1000 micro for 25 volts and the, the ones over there are 1035s so it's probably running off of a 12 and a 24 volt rail the inverter is probably running off of 24 volts and uh, we even have a Chemicon KY primary cap and that's rare uh, the primary cap since they tend to be large case sizes and thus less prone to drying out than the rest of them the, they always tend to cheap out on these but uh, Fujitsu have properly specified it although they have failed with the adhesive so it's a bit loose there but I'm just going to re-glue that Sadly, they, they have opted for two Chinese caps. These are Suscon, or they might be Taiwanese. And they seem to be in some... I don't know, this one almost looks like some kind of filter for this optocoupler. This one could be anything. So, 
they do measure fine, but I'm going to replace these two just out of precaution because I like to have monitors which run forever. The logic board sadly seems to have only SUSCON caps, uh, most notably this large one by the linear, linear regulator, but they have done the right thing and they've placed the capacitor underneath the heatsink so it doesn't seem to run too hot and uh, I had a quick measure, measure around here and everything seems fine you know, the caps on these boards are generally not very critical and we don't even have any switching regulators here it seems so I, I don't think I'm going to bother actually replacing any of these it's really curious that they, they have this uh, large farm of tiny electrolytics say what are they? 10 microfarad, 16 volts I have no idea what those are doing they seem to snake the traces off to well, I don't even know. Something to do with this big ASIC there. Hmm, <laughs> a mystery. And we also have a pretty <laughs> beefy looking uh, dip power amplifier for the speakers. Well, that's a really odd heating arrangement there, but they definitely have a gilded the lily because I don't think that's going to overheat anytime soon. So you can really play hard. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna do the caps and uh, put this thing together and perhaps we can have a look at the calibration results of it. And there we go, all new caps on the inverter board. The old ones uh, did measure a bit uh, on the edge, they're about 100 to 150 milliohms each which really is on the high side for 220 microfarad 35 volt caps. Uh, for reference, I compared them to the Chemicon KY series, which was on the other, uh, the rest of the power supply. And they are specified for a maximum impedance of 87 milliohms at 20 degrees Celsius, which is uh, uh, that already is a relatively high value because the KY series are long endurance caps, where they are not super low impedance caps. You can get uh, these caps down towards 50 milliohms in, in the low impedance series, so these guys are certainly done for. But I got a new set of KZE series installed, which are uh, curiously the uh, one step lower impedance series than the KY series. So these should be uh, probably around 60 milliohms each, something along around that. I haven't checked the data sheet. I also added an extra 470 microfarad cap to the end of the power rail since we only get power in through this connector there so any droop across this rail could potentially cause some noise and my biggest gripe with my other multi CFL monitor was that it had a 200 hertz sound to it which drove me insane over several years and I really don't wish for that to happen with this one and I did notice that the brightness levels below 5% or so, it had a slight hum to it. And uh, it's going to be either because of a droop across the rail of that, or because of mechanical humming from the transformers, which, uh, as you can see, I've taken steps to guide myself against by just gooping them down quite severely. So, I'm hoping that any noise issues are going to be resolved with this, and certainly any reliability issues are going to be. So let's just uh, get this thing properly back together and do your test. Alright, here we go, all assembled back together. And I've got it connected up to my Dell, and I forgot to actually put it on the <laughs> uh, broken connector there, so I just uh, plugged it straight into my GPS to power, so if I had ha managed to short on the power supply, I would have just uh, taken the entire workshop down, including my server and all my critical data stuff. So, at least we know that, that the standby circuit isn't going to explode. Thank you, focus. So, let's see if it actually powers up for real. I did take the liberty of disconnecting the blue power LED because I don't like these. And there we go. And sadly, I can right away hear that we've got a slight 200-ish hertz hum going on, just like it was 
for last time, so that's a bit of a shame. But uh, I've got my Spider 4 here, so let's do a calibration on this thing and uh, see how it actually performs. And you don't need a calibration tool in order to figure out that this thing is bloody bright. We're sitting on my workbench, which is lit by about 40 or 50 watts of LEDs and a couple of tens of watts of T5s, and this thing is easily matching the brightness. In fact, it's surpassing the brightness against its white frame produced by these lights, so that's some quite impressive performance out of a display that is this old, and uh, clearly has a few hours on it since the backlight inverter caps were a bit worn. And here's a basic report on the performance on the display with no calibration at all beyond me just playing around a bit for the controls. So we've got a, a brightness level of 296.4, so about 300 candle per square meter, which is uh, just below the minimum specification for a new panel, so I don't think this thing has too many hours on it at all, but you never know. Again, these panels age very well. A gamma of 2.26, I think the really default was something like 2.1, and a contrast ratio of about 500, and a pretty okay looking colour temperature. The really impressive part about these monitors though is the backlight uniformity. Just look at that, that is not a hint of a tint or a shadow or an unevenness at all anywhere on the panel. If you had a normal edgeless LCD you would basically just expect there to be some kind of unevenness down towards the end where the lamps are, but you just don't get that on one of these. And there we go, we have some calibration results and... They sure do look a bit weird. Mostly the gamut of this display is just silly. The way you, you read this chart is uh, this is the desired response, the sRGB response in the dotted line there. And this is the actual response of the display, which is just weird. It, it goes way, 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 way out. Hell, might even be clipping the. Uh, measurement instrument there, <laughs> right at the edge of the measurable area. Well, I presume it's a measurable area anyway. And it's uh, still just missing a corner there. Hmm. Huh. Really weird. Beyond that, though, we have some pretty normal looking calibration curves. I'm kind of wonky down here in the low end, but eh, I'm not too bothered. The curious thing I noted though was that despite uh, setting the program up for an sRGB response, uh, it actually knocked the gamma down to 2.11 from 2.24, which, you know, 2.24 is pretty spot on for sRGB, which is supposed to be 2.2, so it's done some weird stuff. I'm going to have to just... Uh, use this display for a while, see how it compares to my other ones, which I know are properly calibrated and working as they should. We also did a couple of uh, just a reports after the calibration was done, and uh, uh, this is the calibrated response, and we've got, uh, I set it for about 100 candle per square meter when calibrating, since that's roughly the, the brightness I use these displays at. And uh, it came out as, about as well as it did before, really. We still have our contrast ratio, so it didn't do anything screwy. The software I'm using, Dispcalc GUI, is known, well, at least in my experience, for just kind of ruining the low end. It has a tendency to uh, put the absolute black level to just a couple of steps into the non-black area, so that black is no longer black, but it doesn't seem to have done that this time. So, yeah, I guess that pretty much sums it up. Fujitsu Siemens, whatever it's called, 24W, really nice built, nicely built monitor, and uh, it's going to sit over there. So, thank you for watching. Cheerio.